Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Coming to the Greenwich Civic Center from London's West End, Sir Lloyd Wilson Webber's Rap the Musical. Just give me that big booming bass in your face. That booming bass. Give me that stupid bad rhyme every time. It's drive a crime. Rap the Musical contains no rap music. Oh, going on a drive by, just me, Posse, and me. I'm a gangster of the old school, you can call me OG. Rap the Musical is a celebration for the entire family. I'm in a gang of one. Stuck in this chair, I can't have much fun. But with a mic and a beat, I could get out of this sea. And let all the rap music in Rap the musical, the fun of rap without all that rap. Well, I'm an old gold tooth, and I'll tell you the truth. I live in the mouth of a holy second Don't miss Rap the Musical. You'll want to experience the magic again and again. Open up your heart and let the rap shine in. And now, back to the homage award. Awkward pause. Made Cut. slightly more awkward by the wrong video. Cut here. Tony, cut this out. It's frame rate. It really is. <laughs> it definitely, definitely is frame rate. It's if totally you're wondering frame rate. what show it is, you need not wonder anymore. Both visually and audibly, we're letting you know it's frame rate. From deep under St. Louis, Missouri, in a secret cavern, comes Brian Brushwood. That's right. Behind these walls, stockpiles. There are gallons and gallons of pure, uh, pure water and uh, oats. We got oats and water, so we're going to die of scurvy instead of starvation. Actually, there's a very good, oat, doing, a very good oatmeal stout brewed in St. Louis. I'm doing well. You know yeah. Uh, you're, you, I think you're talking about Schlafly, the, the St. Louis. Yes, I local, am. Right? That's uh, I picked some up, and so I'm enjoying Did you really? Stout right now. It's really, really good. They have a beer to be proud of. I had no idea that, that you actually had one. Yeah, well, I, I, it's not the oatmeal stout, but it's the, uh, it's the coffee oh, okay. stout. Oh, it no, that's good a good stout. one, too. How you doing, man? You have a good week, Tom? Well, you know what? I had an okay week. It was a pretty good week, except for that takedown notice. <laughs> Wow! That, take, right off the bat with the personal baggage. Yeah, Go on. Takedown notice really brought me down. Well, it was, it's it was for frame rate, right? You know, and we we honestly we kind of expect takedown notices to happen to frame rate from time to time, especially on YouTube where they've got that automatic thing because we're showing movie trailers and we're showing we showed last week we showed the Onion AV thing that thirty second commercial. Uh, so we figure we're probably going to run a foul. I don't think we're doing anything illegal, but th those things don't really. No fair they, they, use, right? They trip. They trip a lot of automatic alarms. You know, considering we are we are a news program, we do news and commentary about television, movies, and viral video content. Which of course means we were we will show clips from television, movies, and viral video content, and that means somebody somewhere is just going to instantly. You know, it's going to flip a switch somewhere. But that's not what our takedown was about, though. That was the weird part. No, there were, well, it was funny. I, I saw on Twitter somebody said, hey, frame rate uh, video got taken down. I was like, ah, it's probably from one of the trailers or something. I'll go take a look. So I go look. It was a takedown notice from Eugene Payton. Not from CBS Films or Universal Studios. It was from <laughs> Eugene Payton. I'm like, well, that's odd. So I look up on the Internet. I binged it. Uh, Eugene Payton, and found that that is an account associated with a Filipino broadcast network called ABS-CBN. Like, okay, that's okay. Uh, that's fa that's fair. They're a real broadcast network. He's just looking out for his own. But we didn't play anything from that network. Nope. 
You would think maybe uh, in our little viral video segment or the cold open where we play something crazy that we're like, oh, maybe it would have had a segment from some show mixed in or something. No, there was nothing in the show from that network. Uh, two theories. One theory, he just doesn't like the show. He's just like too much postulating, too much talking about what might be, not enough news. Uh, I'm going to take you down. Other theory, maybe he wants attention. And unfortunately, maybe we're doing a very bad precedent by giving his name on the air because now everybody's going to try to take down the show in the hopes that next week we're like, well, we got taken down next week. But yeah. here's the flaw in your plan, people. You keep doing it, you won't get attention because nobody will know because all our episodes will be taken down. Right. Apparently, there was also a, a takedown notice from ABC, and it was two takedown notices that caused it to be taken down. But I think with YouTube, you only need one. Wait so a minute. Was that the episode where we accidentally made, did that major Caprica spoiler? <laughs> Maybe he's just really upset about that on uh, spoiler principle. That might be it. That might be he's it. Just where like, he's he, like, guys, he, stop. You're ruining it. He was so Caprica. upset. He's like, you know, I, I know I shouldn't use these powers for this, but I'm going to slap them on the hand. And if that's, like, if that's the case, I honestly, I honestly respect that. Yeah, yeah okay. If, if you I don't think so. the DMCA should exist in a way that it could be used for that. But in some way, it's like, well, you know what? Government made it so you can do that. Okay, so in true frame rate fashion, where, let's put on our, our speculation hats. Where do you think, what do you think this says about the nature of the DMCA? And what does it say about where we're headed because, as I understand it, by the letter of the law, uh, news, press, uh, I mean, they, do they pretty much get a universal free pass on copyrighted stuff? Because well, you no. see that on the news all the time. What's the story there? The uh, the story on there is very complicated. This is one of the problems with, with fair use, right? Uh, it has nothing to do with the DMCA. Fair use is defined by four factors. Uh, and, and what news gets away with is commentary. One of the factors is, you know, you're commenting on an event uh, and, and educational institutions can use a fair use exemption in those cases where you can take a copyrighted piece of video or material and, and show it. So, so news is considered under that factor. Uh, other factors are things like did you transform it? In some right. way, did you uh, and and did you uh, and it, that does, don't take that to mean if you transformed it at all, you're fair and clean. It's it's a right. ma it's a matter of did did you transform it? How much did you transform it? Did you undermine the marketplace for the original work in some way? Even if you did transform it, were you were you engaging in commentary? You basically have to take all four factors into account, and it's not one thing where it's like, well, if I fall under one of the factors, I'm fair and clean. The court has to look at all four factors and weigh them together, and then come up with some sort of strange alchemy and determine whether that was fair use or not. So kinda, that's kinda the other thing is, is a lot of people know fair use is a buzzword, but fair use is not a legal entity or it's not, it's not a, a law that protects well, you. Well, the, the four factors are actually statutory. Uh, oh, are they? But, but there's I'm not, kidding. there's not, yeah, see, I've, I've, I was confused on this for a long time. It took like three lawyers to finally explain it to me. The four factors are actually statutory, I believe in the 70s, but... They aren't statutory in the way that it's very clear how to apply them. So the applic they made these four factors, and then they totally left it vague as to how they apply. And so that's why it's like, well, the four factors are statutory, but what they mean, that's up to the judge. Hmm. Well, uh, and in the chat room, I, I, I would submit that the confusion will continue because the chat room, people are saying, no, it's more precedent than statute. And so, I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah, uh, good good place to uh, research this is on the uh, Stanford website, uh, fairuse.stanford.edu. Uh, if you want to look at the four factors and learn about you know what they mean and how they've been applied and what the precedents are, uh, you know there there's good stuff there uh, if you want to dig into it. But they're they're not they're not wrong. The folks in the chat room were saying it's mostly on precedent uh, because precedent is what determines how those four factors are applied and it's just a mess and what the dmca does actually in some ways the dmca makes it uh makes it easier says we don't care if it's copy if it's copyrighted and you circumvented something to get at it you lose even if you have a fair use right to it you lose now there is a there is a there is a counter notice that you can put in place and say well wait a minute i think i should have the right to put this up and then the person who's challenging on a takedown has to take you to court 
But as far as the DMCA is concerned, if I have a DVD and I break copyright protection to make a backup copy, which is considered fair use, I've broken the law. Because what's against the law with the DMCA is breaking copyright protection. The way the DMCA takedown notice applies to YouTube is not about co breaking copyright protection. It's basically saying you can't post copyrighted works and there's a takedown notice procedure that has to be followed. And that's the one where you actually ask the people to take it down. So in YouTube's case, you, you put in a complaint. YouTube takes it down. Then if I say, no, I, I had the right to do that, you put a counter notice saying, no, I had the right to do this, put it back up. YouTube puts it back up. And then it's on to the original copyright holder to say, well, I'm going to take you to court then. And they have, I think, something like 10 days or two weeks uh, to file in court against you. Or they lose the right to put another takedown notice on that particular usage. Did, uh, did you ever see the argument for fair use that was comprised entirely out of contextual clips from Disney movies? Did you ever see that? <laughs> yeah, I did. They, they posted that up on, or po posted. They posted it that up on the Boing Boing. <laughs> Uh, it's up to like 12 million views right now. If you just do a search, type in Fair Use Disney, and it's called A Fairy Use Tale. It's it's really clever, and, and it's amazing what you can say just by using uh, clips from Disney. But we haven't even gotten to our big story yet, Tom. That's right. It's time for the big story. This just in, the big story. By the way, Jason Howell out on vacation and Jammer B filling in on the board, and we totally took him by surprise there. Lightning quick reflexes as he yes. as he played the big story theme. You would never know. It was amazement. That, and the man has superpowers. And yes, exactly. All so right. What is the big story? The big story is Hulu is getting a whole set of really fancy art house pictures. Okay. Uh, the Hulu Plus service is getting access to some 800 movies from the Criterion Collection. You know the Criterion Collection? Yes. Uh, I Well, I always associate it with the best DVDs, the one that have the awesome commentary and... Uh, and, and the best, I mean, is is it something beyond that? Is it a specific collection, like a hallowed hall of awesome movies? Well, yeah, the Criterion Collection is, like you say, it's it's good it's good movies. It's movies selected for their importance in film. Uh, and like, like you pointed out, they often have really good extras in there. But Ingmar Bergman, Kurosawa, Jean-Luc Godard, Federico Fellina, these are the kinds of movies that you can get a Criterion edition of, which are supposed to be better... Uh, better prints, better transfers, higher quality audio, and lots of extras. Now, with Hulu Plus, I don't think you're getting any of the extras. I think you're just right. getting the movies. But you will have, finally, decent movies to choose on Hulu Plus when you're paying your $8 a month. Right up to now, Hulu is pretty much all about TV shows. They've got some movies on there, but it's pretty spare pickings. So, uh, previous to this, Hulu Plus got you, what, instead of the last three episodes of a series, you got the whole past of the series, or what? Uh, well, I'm sorry, say that again? So, Hulu Plus right now, before these movies were added, what did you get for your eight bucks a month? You just got uh, more selection of television shows? Like, I know they've got time selected only like the last three or the last five episodes of Glee or whatever. Do you get the whole, like, uh, before this, what, I still don't understand why, why I should sign up. For Hulu Plus. Okay, well, okay. I, I, yeah, I can answer that. Um, Hulu Plus, for $8 a month, gives you access to Hulu TV shows and movies uh, on a mobile device via an application, like an iPad or, or a BlackBerry. Actually, I don't know if they have a BlackBerry app. But they have an Android. I don't know if they have an Android app. But they have an iPhone app. Uh, and you are able to then watch Hulu Plus stuff on these alternate devices. In fact, Roku... Uh, the device that you hook up to your television has a Hulu Plus app. Boxy says they're in negotiations to get a Hulu Plus app. Uh, so you pay the extra dollars a month to get access to Hulu on devices that would otherwise block browsers from being able to so, use okay. Hulu. This is the compromise because from day one, everyone's been trying to figure out how to get Hulu as a set-top uh, experience. And Hulu's been fighting them every step of the way. So Hulu Plus is the compromise. Where it's like Sulu, no, Sulu, Sulu Plus is a different thing. That's where you get all of the episodes of Star Trek with Sulu for $3 a month. Uh, I don't think I don't, actor, I don't believe that's launched yet. George, that's Well, they're working with George Takei on, on that service. 
<laughs> but the important thing is, oh, man, between you and Justin Robert Young, I can't ever speak again. And I do so good because when you misspeak, I don't, I feel pity for you. I don't mock you on your own But show. you know you have absolute license to not only mock me, but run with whatever I say. I will like, do it. Like hoisting on Boing Boing, for instance. See, ah, see? Okay, now now you're even making fun of yourself on this. But, uh, so here's what I perceive this to be, and it makes sense because you sort of have Netflix streaming is just dominating. Everybody loves Netflix instant streaming. The catalog is getting bigger and bigger, and I'm watching more and more television shows as the full seasons become available for instant streaming. No commercials, and the picture looks amazing, and you can watch it anywhere. You can watch it on your set-top box. Uh, Hulu Plus seems to be jockeying for a Coke versus Pepsi showdown for living room on-demand content, and it makes sense as far as uh, as far as a land grab for them to try to grab more content, and more movies. The problem is, from a branding perspective, this is a terrible, terrible idea. Netflix means movies, and instant streaming is doing very, very well. Hulu means television, and I'm if I want movies, if I th say to myself. I want to watch one of the greatest movies ever made. I want to see something by Akira Kurosawa. I'm going to use that online service that lets me instantly stream awesome movies. What's that called again? It's not going Amazon. To be Hulu Plus. Yeah, oh. it's not going to be Hulu Plus. I'm Actually, Amazon is now the RC Cola in your Coke Pepsi metaphor because you know today they just added the ability to watch live stream. Well, not live streaming movies and TV shows. If you're an Amazon Prime member. So they've got, see, oh, I, you're right. I think RC Cola might be the, you know what? I almost want to call it Dr. Pepper because it's not even trying to be Coke or Pepsi. It's trying well, to be. Well, it's kind of trying to be Netflix. Here's the problem, though. You're totally hitting it right, which is they're all streaming video services, but they're different. Yeah. Netflix says for $8 a month, whether you have, whether you want DVDs or not, right? Minimum $8 a month, you can get streaming movies and television shows on any device that you can connect to the internet that either has a browser or a Netflix app. Uh, but it has to have the Netflix DRM built in, which is why the Netflix app has not come to Android, because they were waiting for Android to build the DRM in. Once that happens, oh, wow. they'll be able to put Netflix on, on, on any Android phone as well. But the point is, we're going to have library television. They just signed a deal with CBS today saying we're going to have Star Trek, MacGyver, all these old CBS shows on. We're not going to do current shows for you, but we'll put all these old library CBS shows onto Netflix or movies. Then you've got Hulu. And Hulu says, for absolutely nothing, for free, you can go to a browser on a laptop and watch all kinds of TV shows. Although we'll get rid of them after like five or six episodes. And we're going to save some of them and put them on Hulu Plus, which you have to pay $8 a month for. If you pay $8 a month, you get Hulu Plus, which gets like full seasons of old episodes of TV. But we actually uh, prevent some of the stuff that's on free Hulu from showing up on Hulu Plus, even though you're paying for it. And now and I, Amazon comes in and says, hey, we got bullshit for movies. There's only like 5,000. But you know what? We're throwing it in for free if you pay for shipping. <laughs> I just want to stand up and sing, I'm proud to be an American. That was beautiful poetry, Tom. Uh, but you did tap onto something that I think is a really good point. And as far as, uh, again, on the branding message, Hulu Plus is associated, Hulu in general is associated with more timely content. If I missed something last week or last month, I'm going to go to Hulu Plus. But if I'm, if somebody tells me what you never watched the shield or what you never watched, you know, Dexter or whatever, it becomes archived. It's almost as though Netflix has, uh, it, or it seems to be working toward an, toward an almost Apple like attitude where it's like, we're going to have everything and it'll be perfect. Uh, or, or what, what we don't have, we're just not going to have it at all. Whereas Hulu seems to be very piecemeal. Like, oh, we got a few episodes over here, a few episodes over here. We don't really have the, 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 the license rights for this other stuff. We're going to let other stuff expire. But then we'll bring it back later if it's super old enough for Hulu Plus. What I don't understand is why Hulu Plus can't have everything that's available on free Hulu. Because Netflix, Netflix is able to say, look... We're going to have your stuff streaming on a laptop, but it's also going to be streaming on a television on Roku. We're also going to have it streaming on, on, a, on a mobile app. And everything they have is available on every one of those platforms. Hulu, the justification I've heard is, well, Hulu Plus is available on mobile. And a lot of people say they'll license it to us for showing on a laptop, but they don't want it showing up on a TV or on a mobile app. So we have to have separate services for that. That just sounds like they didn't 
try hard enough on these licensing deals. Okay, so let's handicap this. Let's make a, a side wager. Three years from now, uh, where where is the Hulu versus Netflix war, or does a third party come in and dominate? Because these guys really are in a full-on race for our hearts and minds and licenses in this land grab. And I got to tell you, uh, as far as my heart right now, Netflix's service is exemplary, and they just keep on growing. I couldn't be happier with it. Uh, I, I want Hulu to catch up because more competition is better, but it just their strategy is just so over, all over the map. I, if I'm predicting, I got to say uh, Hulu or Netflix eventually dominates and becomes the HBO of the 21st century. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a tough one. Three years, right? I, I, can, I can tell you what's going to happen in 25 years okay, well, with, we'll say, with, we'll a, with a lot. And, and I have so. before in Frame Rate, but three years is more of a challenge. I like that. No, I like that. Uh, let's stick with three years. In three years, Netflix will be much more widespread. They'll have many more deals. But I don't think Netflix will be allowed to carry too many current programs. So they have a few things where if it's in a current season, they still have the episodes for it. But not a lot. Uh, studios are really hesitant to do that. Hulu, on the other hand, has got this internal battle going on over what they should allow people to see because their big advantage is current programming, but then they're deathly afraid of having that show up on television and having people not watch their show where they're monetizing it better, which is over cable or over the air. I think Hulu tears itself apart from the inside. I think there's a very good chance that Hulu, like somebody pulls out of it, maybe Comcast pulls, pulls out of it, all, as, as much as they're legally allowed to, uh, maybe because they own NBC, uh, maybe Fox pulls out of it. Uh, I don't think CBS ever enters it, so they're always going to be one leg down on the four major broadcasters in the U.S. And I think that all of these networks start to move away from Hulu and coming up with their own online streams where they have more direct control and giving you current video of their products directly over their websites and Hulu starts to wither away and it becomes you can buy a service like Netflix or Amazon which I think will develop theirs and you'll get movies and it'll be like a channel and you'll have lots of old TV shows but if you want to watch current stuff you're going to have to go network by network and they're going to have their own apps and they're going to have their own websites and it's going to it's actually going to get broken up more and even harder to figure out what's available where for a while. So three years ago, you think it'll be even more fractious and more annoying to find the content. Yeah, because I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay, and you know what? I'm going to agree with that, and I'm even going to make a very specific prediction. Right now, almost all of the best content that's available for instant streaming, the stuff that I want to watch that's uh, that I'm so thrilled when it's on there, are the, the content that's part of the, the what, what's the stars package called? The, the one, the stars on demand that they have available through Netflix. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, it's stars. I think it's stars on demand, but yeah, it's a, it's a licensing deal with stars. Right. Well, when we, uh, I, I predict that stars will threaten to pull out from Netflix out of the deal, possibly to get courted by Hulu, possibly maybe an Amazon Prime thing. Because I'll tell you what, Amazon, if you want Amazon to be a player, they should get a handshake with stars because nobody real. everyone associates it with Netflix. Like there's a branding mismatch. All the best stuff is not Netflix streaming content. It's Netflix partnered with stars. And I think stars is going to realize how much power they have as they continue to, and they can threaten to pull those licenses and go with someone else. And I think all of a sudden they're going to be on the map in a big way. And I think it'll happen in about two, maybe three years. I, I don't know about that. I, I, I don't think that's a crazy prediction, but I also think that Time Warner has made a big deal about how little stars is get pay getting paid. And the other side of that story is that Netflix has been very, very careful about fair dealing with the studios. So I think they're going to pay stars an, a, a valid amount. And it's not going to be that issue where it's like, wow, stars is hardly paying anything. I think Netflix is in a position where they can pay them what their stuff is worth. Uh, I, again, I think I think I think stars may be uh, st stars needs more tools to leverage getting better content. And it sounds and if they don't ha if they're not getting paid enough, it's harder for them to accrue more more licensed content. Well, I think uh, they'll folks, be, I think they'll be getting paid enough. That's all. Okay. Well, we'll see.
we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this clip in two and a half, three years and see who was right. Meanwhile, we have another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. In a very good example of I'm all for strong intellectual property rights until they work against me, the studios are seeking limits on a celebrity's right of publicity. It's a high-stakes case being argued in the California Appeals Court now. Uh, the case is about whether Electronic Arts has to pay college athletes when it uses their image in video games, but could also have ramifications in movies and television shows as well. EA and its supporters argue that if rights of publicity aren't properly balanced against the First Amendment, it would make it impossible to create artwork about famous people, like, for instance, the King's Speech or the Social Network. Uh, the case is a class action suit in which college athletes are suing Electronic Arts for using their images in the NCAA football, NCAA basketball, and NCAA March Madness video games without paying the athletes. I am very much of two different mindsets on this. Uh, part of it is because of the nature of this specific case, because it genuinely irks me that college students, uh, that separate from what we're about to say, because uh, forget this case. In general, it drives me nuts that uh, that the NCAA, that uh, college football are mega, multi, hundreds of millions, billions of dollar businesses where the coaches get paid, the staff get paid, the people who sweep the floors get paid, but the people whose broken bodies are the base of the pyramid, that, that you know, they're people who never walk right again after giving so much of themselves in this game, uh, don't get paid. So in general, uh, I, I think that's outrageous and ridiculous, and I, and I want especially in a case where it's like, well, they pay the professional players for their licenses or for, for their images, but they don't pay the college players just because, just because they're college players. That's ridiculous. And if there's a precedent set, they need to follow through and, and go the rest of the way. But then however, there's, go ahead. However, the flip side is on this case, I don't want anything where you've got to say, mother, may I to write material? There exists people uh, who play a game called basketball and for, you know, I'm going to make a simulation of this actual event here. I, I don't want to have to, uh, uh, somebody I know wrote a book of Seinfeld trivia. And, and because it mentioned, and, you know, there exists a show called Seinfeld and there exist things that they said and did on the show. And this guy had trivia questions about what was said and done on the show. Uh, and uh, they, they totally killed it. They're just like, yeah, no, that's, we own everything. Says the word Seinfeld, that's our word. Uh, so I don't want to go in that direction. But I, I, I don't know. What's your read on this, Tom? Yeah, this is really this is really interesting because sentimentally you look at it and go, well, the NFL made sure that everybody, you know, the NFL Players Association made sure that everybody got paid for EA. On the other side, uh, there was a court case against fantasy leagues saying that you couldn't use the actual stats of players because those were part of the player's property. And the courts ruled against that and said, no, that's public information. It's real information. And the fantasy leagues don't have to pay a license to get that. Uh, right. So the question is, what is Electronic Arts doing? Are they actually taking, it, it goes back to that fair use conversation we had earlier in the show, right? Are they making fair use of the image of these basketball players? And on the one hand, yeah, they are. They're just saying, you know, look, we are making a video game about college basketball. And so if a player looks like that and his name is, you know, Dave Jenkins, we're going to have Dave Jenkins in our game and it's going to look like Dave Jenkins. It's not exactly right. Dave Jenkins, but it's roughly Dave Jenkins. And so he doesn't you, have any say over that. You are selling a simulation of a reality-based event. Just as if you're going to create Microsoft Flight Simulator and you have them fly over Las Vegas, there exists a building called the Stratosphere and it looks roughly like this. And you would be remiss to not include it in the game. It would take you out of the reality of it. And likewise, especially when it comes to sports fans, you know, the psycho ones who know everyone in the game, they're going to notice if you don't factually accurately represent what's going on. Um, but again, I'm just so bummed that college students don't get in any compensation. Well, everyone says scholarships. And, and there's, there's the other side of it for me, which is if I'm making a movie about Aristide Efron, and I cast someone who dresses and looks like Aristide Efron, I should have the right to do that. It's a movie. It's about things that took place. As long as I'm not defaming, you know, as long as I'm not slandering, libeling, then I should have the right to do that. 
But a video game seems to work in a little bit of a different universe, right? It's not just straight reporting, which is what a movie essentially is. It's, it's actually making a product, making a thing, making something new out of someone's uh, visage. So I think, they're, I think they're, it's more complicated than that. And that's EA's defense. is like, this is a complex thing. We're using all kinds of, of, of things in here. And it's not just taking someone's visage and selling a game with it. But in essence, it's, taking more, it's more than just their looks. It's taking their person. Well, uh, there was, uh, I'll tell you, to, to make it even more co uh, complicated in the chat room, I'm going to have to rely on the hive mind to get me the name of it. But there was a video game that would make a, a company was making a series of first person shooters that were designed to bring the experience of real life events happening currently in the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq to home viewers to experience. There was one where you essentially went and found Saddam Hussein inside his spider hole. Uh, I, in that case, you're taking real life situations that happened, and the big question was whether or not uh, whether or not it was appropriate, whether it was tacky. Uh, that's one set of questions, but whether or not it's legal from a licensing standpoint, you know, it's like does that mean? Let's say they made it exactly note perfect. Does that mean that we they would owe a check to uh, you know to to Saddam Hussein for making an appearance well, uh, an appearance in the game? Actually, there there is there's lots of good case law about. Um, public figures uh, and and what the differences are in using the 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 faces and the, and the quotes of public figures versus private figures somebody who is a leader of a country is considered a public figure and it's really hard to prove libel and slander against a public figure much less uh, restrict someone from using their picture so that's why right. that Obama hope case is really interesting because the artist took an AP photograph and made a the hope the famous obama hope paintings out of that and the ap right. is suing not obama right. obama has right. president That's obama has no standing he's a public figure so saddam hussein is a public figure college basketball players they're public figures but they're not on the level of politicians they're not you know so how public are they it's a, it's a it's a really really challenging case yeah that uh that whole ap thing um I, I don't know. Just saying someone's a public figure, though. Uh, Obama's a public figure, so it's fine for you to snap a photo of his likeness and sell it. They yeah. took a picture of him. It's, it's their no picture. Way, yeah. Without his permission, right? Sure. They took a picture of him without his permission, and they sold it and made a profit on it, claiming, oh, but we're allowed to do that because we're news. And as we've already discussed on Frame Rate, I don't, understand, I don't see news as being anything different from reality television. From the full on, they they audition ideas, they pilot stuff, and it picks up. Then we see it for a few weeks they, they, in a twenty four hour news cycle, and maybe if they like it, it gets renewed for a second season when we see the trial date come up for for for, for more of the same. But it's like in this case, I, I don't see how AP is in any good state because now you have a publicly disseminated photo that's out there of Obama. Right, but it's to, but they're they're two different pieces of property, right? If they had taken a picture of Kuhan, uh, he would be able to tell AP, you can't sell that without giving me a cut. But because they took a picture of President Obama, who is a public figure, he can't do that. So that side of the equation is left out. But let's say they did take a picture of Kuhan and got his agreement and cut him in on the proceeds, then they could go sell it and they could prevent other people from selling it, not just as an agent of him, but because they own the picture. So with right, the president, but, 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 so, the, so, because he's a public not. figure, that part is cut out, they still own the picture. Okay, but it's the work the of the photographer. What, what Shepard Ferry did is create a new work of art that was based on that photo. Okay, now it's not the same photo. He did not take the exact photo, write the words, you know, check it out, it's Obama, and stuck them on. Right, and, and this is sell, sell it again. We've got he a theme going on. We've got a theme going on because it all ties back to the four factors of fair use. And the court said it was transformative, but it wasn't transformative enough. And it may have impacted the marketplace for that original photo because he should have paid a license fee. And therefore, he doesn't get a fair use to fix. Okay, you're telling me, you're telling me, like, uh, first of all, and, and uh, let's not that we dive too often into discussing or breaking down art. But, uh, but that was uh, a clever painting in that it used red and blue and fused them together. And it, it captured, you know, what he saw and wanted to see in Obama and, 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 and put his own unique spin on it for what he did. Uh, you're telling me that is not transformative enough. But Andy Warhol. I'm, I'm not telling you that. The Campbell's Soup label, a commercial property. 
And it's like, but bing bang, it's Ertz. The courts have said that, not me. I know. That's I'm and that's saying, what's you, so crazy saying, about fair use. One, right? You're using you in the third person. I get it. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on, shall we? Yes, please. To film film. I sort of hate that I've locked myself into using this voice every time we start another segment of Film Falm. You may hate it, but the rest of the world loves it. <laughs> it hurts my the voice a little. The tones of one Tomas Marit ringing out over the radio and across the globe. Film Falm. So io9 uh, has a posting up about a meticulous fan-assembled documentary of the Star Wars trilogy that I have only watched the first part of because I just haven't had enough time to go through it all, but the first part alone was fantastic. Essentially, this fan took all of the, the available quotes, all of the available footage, things from DVD extras, and has made a documentary of the creation of Star Wars from the beginning. And I think it may have... Uh, the approval of Lucasfilm because a it hasn't been yanked down off YouTube and the Lucasfilm logo is at the very beginning of it. Yeah, but hold on, hold on. Uh, if if Lucas was going to yank anything, it would have been that fantastic Phantom Menace review from Red Letter Media. That's just maggoty, completely covered in Star Wars footage and from all three movies, from the prequels but and, and a bunch of other. But but stuff. it does have other stuff. Right? It does have original stuff. This documentary is cut entirely from things that are the property of Lucasfilm. No, wait. Everything is, is, is a Lucas thing? There's not <sighs> like him him from some interview that somebody else owns? I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swear to that. But right at the beginning, it says Star Wars Begins, which is the name of the documentary, is an unofficial commentary on Star Wars. It contains video clips, audio from the cast and crew, alternate angles, bloopers, text facts, and insights into the development and creation of the film. Uh, and honestly... All of the stuff I've seen seems to come from DVD extras and that sort of thing, uh, which are properties of Lucasfilm. All right. Well, I mean, let's... I, uh, there okay. probably is some other stuff here that isn't, but... And he is calling it unofficial, so it may not be property well, of, but as here's, litigious here's, as Lucasfilm is on this stuff, the fact that it's being allowed is... I don't know. It's pretty crazy. Well, and he, this is one of the things that drives me the nut, most nuts about the way copyright law works is... He can't. Let's say he genuinely likes it and he wants it to be out there. But the problem is, if he doesn't actively defend his copyright, doesn't doesn't that mean he gives up? For no, the, no, the no, rights? no. That's a myth. Uh, that's a myth born of trademark law. There is oh, a right. there that's is a, a theory that if you don't aggressively defend your trademark, that you might suffer in a court case when you're trying to prove that the trademark is yours and shouldn't be used by anyone else. Uh, I'm so happy to hear that. I'm so happy to hear that's a myth. Now, here, I, I, I asked uh, Jammerby to freeze on a particular part. Look at this. This is the original scroll of Star Wars. Now, in the audio yeah. edition, what we're seeing is the the text kind of you know scrolling off into the background, and it says, it is a period of civil war, rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base, blah, 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 blah. Notice what was missing there? Oh, Star Wars, Episode 1. It does not say Episode, episode four. 4. And he says yeah. the title Episode 4, A New Hope, was added to the roll-up for the 1981 re-release. It was not on any prints in 1977. No. Really? Yeah. This is huge. Right. Because the whole idea was like, well, it was always Episode 4. Apparently not. Not according wow. to it's, it's, Star Wars like Begins. This money machine was always meant to run forever. Yes. Yeah, since the moment I turned it on and the dollars came out. I'll tell course, you what. That's what I meant. I'll tell you what the most damning evidence that George Lucas did not plan for this to be as huge and united as it has been from the very beginning is the existence of the Star Wars Christmas special. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Where, where they go to Kashyyyk and, uh, yeah, well, like what specifically is, is, tip, is your tip off there? Uh, because he never would do that. Once he realized the merchandising value of his characters, allowing a network television company to take your property and create a mythology out of it using the actual characters and their actual outfits 
without any modification and having it be that story. It, it was it was a different time, man. Uh, he was, he obviously he obviously was doing what I would do if I put out a movie and somebody came to me and said, "Hey, your movie's pretty successful. We want to do a primetime special around it." Yes. Go for yeah, it. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, sign where do I sign? And the, the paycheck goes to me. Thanks. Right. Whereas later he said, "Oh, no, this is a uh, this is a conceived whole of an entire universe. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't want you to take that. We have to work very carefully on the mythology and the unification and these characters are very valuable. Uh, we have to treat them with respect. That's not how he talks." Did you ever but. Did you ever read any of the George Lucas penned novels in the uh, Star Wars universe, Splinter of the Mind's Eye? Yes, Spl I, 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 Splinter of the Mind's Eye was the first Star Wars book I ever read. Uh, I'll tell you, man, I went through a phase where I read so much of the Star Wars expanded universe. The Tales of the Bounty Hunters, Tales of the Cantina, Tales of the Most Eisley uh, or, uh, in Jabba's Palace were excellent. Were the, some of the top-notch sci-fi writers... Uh, from from everywhere wrote for it, and uh, they eventually wrote this cohesive. The Timothy Zahn books were amazing. They wrote this cohesive narrative where they covered up so many of the mistakes George Lucas made. Like there's there's an entire chapter to explain why why you would measure the Kessel Run in you know t using parsecs as a right right to cover up that so. gaff in the script. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then and then I was so offended when he got ready to do the prequels and just waved his hands and be like ah. Books are books. This is the real stuff. I well, so Alan Dean Foster wrote Splinter of the Mind's Eye, but he wrote it off of Lucas's notes. And what's really interesting is there are big inconsistencies. Not, Well, maybe not that big, but there are inconsistencies between Splinter of the Mind's Eye and Empire Strikes Back. And you again, I think that's another piece of evidence that this was not a whole from the beginning. It was one of those things where he's like, well, this is where I think I'm going with this, Alan. Write this up. And then right. when he got to Empire Strikes Back, they're like, well... Let's not, you know, it was just a book. Let's not worry too much about that. Let's make a good movie. And so they, they, they trampled on, on some of that stuff. But, but that's fine. But it, it wasn't, when that book came out, it was not part of this large, expansive, very consistent universe that they were working on uh, as, as well. It was a one-off book and the guy, who wrote, you know, it was the guy who wrote it. And, and, you know, who knows? I don't know what the sales figures were, but I would imagine they were low enough that you could afford. It wasn't like you had fans clamoring like, hey, we really love this book. Please be true to it, uh, which you did have with the Expanded Universe. The Expanded Universe of Star Wars has a very passionate fan base of people who really dug it. And it was, you know, kind of a big slap in the face to be like, man. Now that's, we, that's my George Lucas impression, by the way. We have an, we have a uh, an accusation from Jason C in the chat room, Brian Brushwood. How do you respond to this? This podcast should be called Star Wars Sucks Weekly. Every time I watch, it's Star Wars bashing. Brian, respond. <laughs> oh my gosh! You know what? I uh, you are talking to somebody who really, really loved Star Wars and uh, uh, felt very betrayed by how everything went out. And you're right. I will. That's it. No more. No more bashing of the Star Wars. No, I think we bash because we love. Yes. Right? It's, well, specifically, it's George Lucas. But we don't, we don't bash all the time. No, Just not all bashing all the time. Most of the time. Uh, no, and, and frankly, the reason we picked this as, as our film film story is because it's so awesome to watch and see all of this stuff about how it was made. There's so many cool behind-the-scenes stuff. If you've watched every DVD outtake, every DVD extra, you've seen all of this stuff before. But even so, the way it's weaved together uh, by this fan is is so nice. It, it, it really feels like a documentary, and you're seeing everything in order in a way that it's never been presented before. So yeah, and, uh, highly uh, recommend I'll it. tell you, a lot of DVD extras so often are just these naked pieces. Like, hey, here's some, you like extra crap? Um, here's, here's a scene of a Wookiee with his costume head taken off. Yeah. Uh, take that. But it's like, uh, but when you get somebody who knows how to tell a story and put things together and give a context and, uh, and lead you to some kind of conclusion... Uh, it's really precious. I mean, it's it's fantastic. All right, you watching? Uh, do you see any films? I haven't seen any films this past week. As uh, a matter of fact, uh, I got up early yesterday. I'm at this four day conference, which you know that's why my voice is trash. I'm doing my impression of you from last month, right? Where I've got a raspy <laughs> voice that is unrecognizable. Well, Brian. I, got up, <laughs> I got up early yesterday, uh, and. We went and saw The King's Speech, and it was great because I brought a bunch of people who had no idea what it was. I only had the loosest idea about it. And we went to this movie theater that if NPR had a movie theater, this would be it. It was inside of a hotel in the middle of downtown 
St. Louis, and it was filled with a bunch of affluent uh, white liberal women aged, you know, 40 to 55. Uh, and like one of them with my buddies in line, they're all like, so it's King's speech. What's it about? I guess a king makes a speech or something. I haven't heard of it. And this lady was just aghast. She was just like, it's up for 12 nominations for Academy Awards. And so we went in and sat down. And can I tell you the most striking thing about my experience of watching the King's speech is I had not realized how spoiled I had become by going to the Alamo Draft House in Austin, Texas. This may be the first movie that I've watched on a, a genuine film projector in over a year. Because the moment it started up, I thought there was a problem because the the text was jiggling all around. And I'm like, what, what, what's, what, 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 uh, jiggly text, what's up? And then I realized, I was like, oh, that's right. That's what, that's what all film projectors do. And then later there was a factory splice right there, one of those lines in the middle of it, which by the way, as a projectionist, I learned you're supposed to remove those manually. But, uh, and then, you know, there's, there's hair and dust in the film. It was, it was shocking to me how old-fashioned this movie-watching experience it seemed. And I guess it's just because uh, the digital... Uh, I'm now on board. I, 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 I want the complete elimination of all... Uh, of, uh, or let me put it this way. If I have a flat decision, I cannot imagine I will ever choose a real film over a digital projection for a new release. Now, there are some retro experiences I'd like to have. I'd love to watch Flash Gordon on an original nice uh, film print. But, man, digital has completely supplanted it. To me now, digital is the right way to watch a movie. No kidding. All right. And so it's, it was a, uh, it was, it sounds like it was a religious experience. You were converted. Uh, yes. Plus, uh, the movie was pretty good too. I liked, uh, I liked the King's speech fine. Uh, I don't see it as a, a, a you know, uh, when, oh, I know we're not in the prediction making business outside of the fact that we spend all our time making predictions. Uh, but uh, do you have a best picture pick? You think you know who's going to win best picture? No, I don't yet. When when, when are the Oscars? Pretty soon. They're not the Sunday. Pretty, yeah, we got a little. Ways. I got. I got. I'm pretty sure that Colin Firth's going to win Best Actor uh, in a male role, and I'm pretty sure that um, Lynn Swan. No, what's her name? Natalie Portman is going to win uh, a uh, Best Actor in a female role. They just call them Best Actress and Actor again, don't they? They they change that back anyway. Um, sure, those are the only two things I'm certain about. Uh, I think Social Network has a shot at Best Picture. No, I, I'm I not think convinced, it's going to be Inception for no other reason because of the snub that Christopher Nolan got. I figure it's got to be Inception. That's his gimme as a uh, as a take back. I also uh, think that really, uh, you know, I I saw the King's speech with George Lucas, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to drop his name. <laughs> ah! You and your buddy George just hanging out. Hey, no, the, the Oscars are this Sunday, February 27th. How about that? Eight o'clock Eastern on ABC. All right, so yeah, so that that was there we go. That's my Oscar pre predictions. <laughs> Is that it will be this Sunday? Yeah. All right, on to the tube tops. I just caught up on a lot of television, uh, and uh, I have to say, this spring, this winter spring. Not nearly as fun as watching all that sci-fi stuff. Sci-fi canceled all their good shows. Now I'm just like, eh. Top Chefs, All Stars is pretty good. Enjoying that. How far off are we from Breaking Bad coming back? I figure it's just got to be. They're usually a spring show. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Game Game of Thrones is coming up uh, end of March on HBO. Oh gosh! So that will be absolutely worth watching. I watched the trailer again for uh, Game of Thrones. A friend of mine, I finally got into the books. And we, we must have spent an hour talking about what's so great about this universe that's been created and uh, how right HBO treats that material. Uh, specifically, we were talking about, I was lamenting that HBO is not going or, or did not get the opportunity to give the Game of Thrones treatment to the Dark Tower series, which is the only way I thought it could have been handled correctly. I'm actually not a fan of what they're looking to do with the Dark Tower. All right. I, by the way, uh, just a little Dark Tower update for you. I am yeah. through book four. I finished. Uh, I finished book four, and then I immediately turned to the stand, and I'm, about, yes! I'm halfway through the stand. Which, by the way, kind of weird to read right after you kick out over a cold. Uh, and then I am going to probably go Salem's Lot, and maybe like one of the short stories. I found a really good list on Amazon that recommends an order of reading them. 
But okay. I, I got to go to Wolves of Cala pretty soon. I can't hold okay, off well, for all of the books. So maybe not, maybe the not. story that's in Hearts of Atlantis, Salem's Lot, and then I'm going to move on to book five. I was, yeah, that's the one that you absolutely must not go on to the rest until you read Hearts of Atlantis. Well, I'm about to be pre presented something a book. Here. This is a book in burlap. My gosh. It's just arrived from Great Britain. From Great Britain? <laughs> it has. It doesn't look like it. Well, they use burlap a lot there. They don't have finer <laughs> materials. On Savile Row. Savile Row. They I use the burlap. I have a of this. It's the most comfortable thing, and it wears like the dickens. What the hell is this? Uh, yeah, there's a kitten on it. There's a kitten, and see, there's Mickey Mouse. Is this The Dark Tower, book five? No, but it's close. <laughs> it's wrapped in tissue and burlap. It's a I thought this came from Argentina. No, this is that's the sweater. This is, which feels it like, like the same thing. As a matter of fact, look at that. I was it's a little the same confused fine there. Quality. Uh, what is this? This is with a little help by Cory Doctorow. Look, hey! there's a chip on it. It's got an SD card. Is that? Don't oh, peel it off. Yeah, yeah. Nuts. I was about to pull it off. No, actually, it's fine. Oh, look at that. That's great. So uh, this is a limited edition of Cory's newest book. Oh, you can't really see. Which it. is called yeah. with a little help. And it's short stories, but on the SD card is the audio, and I recorded one of the stories. Oh, so fantastic. So I ordered the book. It was fairly expensive, but it should have an inscription from Corey. Oh, yeah, there it is. For Leo, you are made of 100% pure, unadulterated, awesome sauce and burlap. <laughs> I can't thank you enough. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's nice. That's great. Oh, that's great. And, you know, I think this is uh, being considered for a Hugo. As it should be. It's yeah. It's really amazing. This has the one where the sysadmins are the last people left on Earth. Uh, yeah, when sysadmins ruled the Earth. Yeah. I love that story. It's such a great story. It's really, it's a great post-apocalyptic geek story. Oh, check that out. Page from my high school lecture notes <laughs> is on the end cap. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that is. But That's awesome. Isn't that funny? So Corey had these specially printed. Oh, these are, this is fantastic. And I thought I'd support it because the guy needs money. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, number, number 72. 72 out of 250. Isn't that cool? Really cool. So that'll go on the bookshelf. All right. Often. Anyway, I thought, since you were talking about books. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was cool. And you can uh, keep can the I keep the burlap? Please, oh, thank you. My gift to you. Uh, <laughs> Brian, your burlap's in the mail, Brian. I'll yeah, wear fantastic. It. Wear it in good health. Awesome. Uh, do we got anything to talk about and interfere on? Uh, Minecraft uh, got a uh, documentary, got, uh, and there's a 20-minute preview, but they need you to chip in if you want to finish the documentary about Minecraft. Uh, for anybody who plays a lot of video games, uh, the Minecraft story and success is a genuine curiosity. And I, for one, would really like to see a documentary because while I've enjoyed playing it, and I certainly enjoy seeing all the works people have created with it, in it, I want somebody to tell the story of Minecraft's success because perversely it's essentially it's second life but way worse and somehow that makes it way better they everything's just, super low resolution and super simplistic and less turns out to be way way more somehow they just need $150,000 to finish the documentary uh, they've got 38,681 as of this recording uh, so if you're interested go to Kickstarter and look up Minecraft the story of Mojang now we have wicked lasers. My lasers came! Uh -oh. This is so exciting! <laughs> now when your swords come... I can put your eyes out! <laughs> or we can find blow up a balloon from a distance. <laughs> from a distance. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did you just start singing a Bette Midler song? I did, a little you bit. You just started singing a Bette Midler song. A little song, bit, yeah, you? I did. Just, okay, a, just right. a snatch. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's finish up with a couple of emails. I did the same Bette Midler like that, call her names. She's hey, just uh, waiting wanna, on a friend. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, hey, remember last week we had uh, Christopher Nolan wrote us a letter? Right, right. That was very exciting until we found out it wasn't that Christopher Nolan. But then it was right, well, a different Alan kind of Moore exciting. Alan Moore just wrote us a letter. Alan Moore? From yeah, Star that, Trek and Battlestar? Go oh. oh. No, no, not, no, that, no. not that guy. Not that guy. Wait, are you thinking Ronald D. Moore? Oh, right. He was the Star Trek guy. Alan Moore is a different guy. Uh, he's he Watchmen. Watchmen, didn't he? <laughs> he's Watchmen, yeah. <laughs> so it was a double joke, only I didn't know it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Alan Moore writes, Hey, Tom and Brian, I've been listening since your open beta. I love the show. I watch the podcast every week. I hear you talk about the Venture Brothers and other Adult Swim shows and thought you should check out their new app. It's universal and has some full episodes from almost all the shows, including Ooh, old cool. ones like Harvey Birdman and C-Lab. Nice. There's not many episodes available yet, but I'm sure streaming licenses will come with time. This, uh, this I think, uh, might be 
an interesting trend as people take their content and make it directly available. Yes. Uh, imagine as more people produce their own shows in house, Tom, I would imagine that it would be increasingly, increasingly easy to just say, here's all of it from beginning to end. Just get the app. And, you know, and you could charge your own rate much as uh, I think it was, was it Allison chains? Uh, no, or no, no, no. Uh, I forget who it was. Radiohead? That released their album as an app. Oh, was, oh yeah. Oh, who was it? Nine. It wasn't nine inch nails. Who was that? Uh, no, was, but but the, the movie studios have also started putting out uh, movies as apps. So instead of buying them yes. through the iTunes store, you buy an app and it comes with extras. Right. Yeah. No, so I think, awesome. that, I, so think I, that, I think this is going to continue. And this is what was informing my idea that Hulu starts to get torn apart as people want to do that more often and have direct control. Well, and it's funny because the whole reason Hulu is popular is because you're cutting out so many middlemen. And, and now finally people realize like, wait a minute, Hulu. Aren't you a middleman too? And then to just cut them out as well. All right, we got uh, one last email. Says, well, I took your challenge and watched a random Netflix instant movie all the way through. It was Exam, an independent film in the vein of Cube, <laughs> only without as much gore and with a much lighter story. Exam was one of <laughs> those tough. films <laughs> where <laughs> I tough. couldn't. What, what's that's, wrong? That's that's the same one you read two weeks in a row already. That's oh, you oh, already I'm sorry, my my fault. <laughs> Here, here it is. Hey, Brian and Tom. Tom, as you know, I live in South Africa, and thus we only get the TV series way after you do. As you might or might not know, Telltale Games, the guys behind the recent episode Back to the Future Adventure Game series, have just announced they've acquired the license to make a game based on The Walking Dead. As far as I can see, the game will be based on the comic and not the television series. This led me to buy the first compilation of the comic on the Comixology app. First, I have to say, after just reading the first edition, Wow. My question to you now is, with hindsight of seeing the whole first series, should I watch the series too? I remember you being very complimentary initially, but the compliments seem to get fewer near the end. As a whole, is it worth it? Rinus. Yeah, well, first of all, yes. Number one, go ahead and read all the comics. Enjoy that whole experience and have that whole story. And then get ready for a completely independent take on the same story. You'll see the same characters and stuff, but there were things they had to do for television, which led to some episodes that were very unwalking dead. Like, and we talked about this. Uh, I, I was not, it, the last episode was my least favorite of them, but from a television standpoint, I do understand how important it was that they make it very clear uh, that, that there are certain things that will not happen in this story, and one of them is that we're going to find a cure for the zombies. And I think one of the reasons the compliments got less is the first episode was stunning yes. in how good it was. The last episode of the series, Walking Dead, is good, and I would say better than 82% of the things that have been produced for television ever. Yep. But it uh, wasn't yep. as stunning as that first episode, and so in, re in relation at the time, it was like, oh, I feel like it's, it's not getting better, but that doesn't mean it's bad. And I would absolutely right. agree with you, Brian. Watch the whole series. Read the comic books all the way through first. Sounds like yeah. you're going to have to yes, wait yes. anyway. Definitely read them on the Comixology app. The Comixology app is exceptional. And it, I just, same thing with Comixology, I feel like for Hulu, I just want them to grab all the licenses, get everybody on board, because I just don't want to experience paper anymore. I just want my stories to be fueled by the iPad from now on. If you want to send in your questions... Or if you saw a random movie called Exam that you'd like to tell Tom about how you only kind of liked it, then send it to us at frameratereshow at gmail.com. I'm a little a bit behind on them this week, but I'll get all caught up for next week, and I'll write responses to all of you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. You can find us at twit.tv slash fr. We'll see you next week. Very danceable, too. From deep within his bunker. I just want to share my new <laughs> diet with you all. It's called heavy cream and bacon. Mm -hmm. oh, what? Mm. Now, do you cook? This is the, the bacon? greatest invention ever. Or do you fry the bacon in the cream? You you could do both. <laughs> you could do both as long as you don't have any of the evil vegetables or fruit. Where's the Where's the chip that has the audio version? <laughs> <laughs> That's it here in the wicked laser. <laughs> Henry's gonna be so happy. Uh,
You know, Waz was, you know, Waz a big laser fan. Yeah, right. And he said he's never been prouder than when his son was arrested by Homeland Security <laughs> for using his laser. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like Waz. Yeah. He says, I'm a proud man. Someday you'll be that proud. You, you, you sure you don't mind if I take the burlap? Oh, I, I <laughs> look at this. <laughs> Shannon. That's crazy. We, yeah, we Why should... did Corey put that in burlap? He is so funny. Because you know he actually had to make a special trip to get some to freaking get the burlap. burlap. Yeah. Is, is there a special message printed on it? Yeah. Track on trading. Washed. Vera Chef. Knowing Corey, he probably bought coffee in that burlap. Yeah. So he didn't have to go maybe, out. Maybe he had it. Yeah. Really and he probably <laughs> traveled right down no, to the no, farm. No, okay, you picked a bad day to wear a blue blazer. I just want to say that. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. All right. Slow, slow vision. Herka jerkatron. You just need to get that um, that lamp out of the shot. If you can, if you can just adjust it. The uh, there's a, yeah that one. Here, you That's really. If, we, if you could just stand there, Kuhan. <laughs> That's perfect. That, I think that'd be delightful. 